Welcome to the June 16th, 2021 Planning Board meeting. I'm Bonnie Sontag. I'm chair of the Planning Board. I will start with roll call as we always do with an online meeting. Alden Clark. Here. Beth Delisle. Here. Ann Gardner. Ann, you're muted. I'll come back to her. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, Bonnie, I'm here. Okay, good. Liam McGavern will not be with us tonight. Rick Tainter. Here. MJ Verde. Here. Uh -oh. um, Don Walters. Here. Bonnie Sontag here. Linda Guthrie, our note taker is with us and it looks like Andy Part Port is the uh, representative from the planning office with us tonight. Um, the agenda is as follows. We have um, requests for minor modifications at one Boston Way and three Boston Way. Then we have correspondence with a letter from residents of the Evergreen Development re regarding a proposed fence. Um, then we have approval of minutes for the 519 meeting. We only received the minutes for the six um, of the June 2nd meeting tonight. So we will postpone the review of and approval of those until our next meeting. The majority of our meeting will be taken up with planning discussions. And then we will close out the public meeting and go into executive session to um, review minutes from a prior executive session meeting that we had. So, um, to get started, we'll go right straight to the minor modifications for one and three Boston Way. Andy, can you tell me if we have um, anyone representing the applicant? Yes, uh, we, I think we have Lou Minacucci here. Um, Lou, if you are able to unmute, you should be able to speak to the board if you'd like. Um, I'm also happy to um, speak to the board about where we left off with Karen uh, on this issue, but uh, I see you're here. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. I guess I'm here to answer questions, but. Okay. Well, I mean, what we could do, Lou, um, if it's easier for you, we'll just have um, Andy update everybody on um, the changes because we did look at this at our last meeting. We kind of know what to expect. Um, okay. And I'm glad you're here and um, we'll just get either confirmation or answer to questions afterwards. So. Um, Andy, can you um, clarify the changes? Sure. Uh, so hopefully you can see what it's on my screen here. I get a little bit of lag and zoom on my end, um, but hopefully you're seeing the GIS of the city here down on Boston Way. Uh, I've highlighted the one Boston Way project. So the uh, primary point of discussion at the last meeting for the modification request, which I don't think was uh, much of an issue conceptually was that uh, Rick had pointed out that uh, there was a request to um, tie the condition for the paving of one Boston way, which uh, from this had, had gone to the end of uh, or 10 feet beyond the one Boston way site um, to basically tie that repaving to the end of three of the three Boston way development um, because the MBTA had done some resurfacing um, and the, um, the three Boston way project is going to have a fair amount of construction vehicles going back and forth um, down to that end of the site. So it really makes more sense to have the repaving of Boston way uh, provided by the developer, the surface uh, repaving after the three Boston way development. So um, Karen and Caitlin and I had discussed this, Karen from Minico uh, um, with Lou Minicucci had talked about this modification um, following the plan board's discussion and agreed. Uh, and you have in your um, your uh, meeting materials, the request from um, from them to remove the condition for paving from one Boston way and then add it to the three Boston way decision. Um, again, going to the 10 feet beyond the, the uh, project site, in this case, three Boston way. Um, that uh, makes, I think, sense to me, uh, satisfies the concern that was raised before that it be tied to the three Boston way project. Uh, at that point, rather than the one Boston Way project. Um, I think everything else in the request, um, in my recollection was that there weren't any um, issues per se with those, but I'm happy to address that as well. Okay, I just wanna clarify um, the new language for the special condition for three Boston Way. I believe it's incorrect as it's stated in our, our uh, staff report. It says, um, 
to a point 10 feet past the boundary with one Boston Way. I think it should say 10 feet past the boundary with three Boston Way. Is that correct? Uh, yes, there. I think there was a um, correction or a letter or revised letter, but the letter that was most recently submitted by um, Three Boston Way LLC, uh, Miko, is um, June 25th, or sorry, uh, June 15th, and that letter is correctly written to say 10 feet past the southern uh, boundary of Three Boston Way. Okay, it's just that I want this motion to be correct in the minutes. Right. Um, and change the language. Um, right now it says no later than the receipt of a final certificate of occupancy. And we normally say before the receipt of a final certificate of occupancy, would that be? Agreed. We will. You're correct. We agreed. We will make that um, clarification in the language so it matches what we usually write. Okay, good. So um, that's what jumped out at me. Did anybody else have any concerns or um, corrections on this? Uh, Bonnie, this is Don. Uh, what is the approximate square footage we're talking about? I don't know. Um, I, could, you know I, could run, uh, I could run a quick number right now from the GIS of the, you mean the linear feet or to the square footage or um, surface area of the asphalt? Well, let me, yeah, I, I'm assuming what, what we're talking about is not paving the area because they're going to be construction on the second site. So why pave it? Uh, you know, plus it's to park a row, get all messed up, et cetera. Is that, that's kind of a, the, the, the common sense approach, right? Right. right. The idea here is to wait until they are done with construction at Three Boston Way before requiring the resurfacing, uh, which it does not make sense. When we did the One Boston Way, the concern at that point was that after One Boston Way, the roadway get repaved or resurfaced so that it's a nice smooth coat. Um, the, um, now that Three Boston Way is under construction, um, I guess the Office of Planning and Development would agree with the development team that it makes more sense to tie that to the end of Three Boston Way's construction. Um, so that's what we're suggesting here. Not that uh, the condition be removed at all. In fact, um, it just re it reinsures that the roadway gets uh, completed when the all the construction that we're going to see on Boston Way from um, this 40-hour project, uh, you know, collectively is done. Right. I mean, and to me, the only risk that that we're we're taking on is, and the unlikely de minimis possibility that the project is not is doesn't complete is is not completed. For whatever reason, sure, and I, I know it again. Technical could be financial. There could be a fire. Who knows what it was? And based upon this, then you would not be paving the um, the first section that we anticipated. Um, I just let you. I'm okay with that, but I just wanted to throw out that there is a risk that that can happen because there's no drop deadline, irrespective of what happens with the other facility, other project. Right. Yeah, understood, Don. I think the, the rationale here, I guess, for the office to not have a concern about that on the balance is just that the resurfacing was, you know, it, is not in bad condition right now. So even if that sure. project were not to proceed, it's not like, you know, it, it, if the uh, if there hadn't been work done on it to, to kind of clean up the surface a bit more recently, we, we probably wouldn't we'd have the same concern, I guess. But right. Okay, right. thanks. No, sounds good. Don, I, I just wanted to say, Lumen I just wanted to say that when we were, Getting one Boston Way approved, the uh, Boston Way itself was in pretty poor condition. And the MBTA, apparently unbeknownst to any of us, including myself, totally before we started, just before we started construction, about two and a half, three years ago, completely resurfaced Boston Way. So actually, and we used that direct access right up to Parker Street for the most part. So one Boston Way is nearly in perfect condition, uh, or the length of one Boston Way on Boston Way is nearly in perfect condition because it just been resurfaced three years ago by the MBTA and we didn't do anything to really disrupt that. The, I think that when we do complete three Boston Way, we're bringing down a new water line. So one of our conditions was to bring a new water line down the Boston Way, in which case we will be digging up the road and it won't be in as good a condition as it is now. So. No, it makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Good. Would anyone else uh, like to comment on this? Okay, we're gonna need two motions. The first is to delete condition 12, which referred to paving of Boston Way from the one Boston Way Smart Growth District 
plan approval decision. May I have a motion for that? So moved, Bonnie. Don. Don, thank you. Second. Ann, second. Thank you, Ann. And I'll call roll for um, approval of that motion. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Don? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. OK. And then the motion is to add a special condition to the three Boston Way Smart Growth District plan approval decision. The applicant shall pave the full width of Boston Way from Parker Street to a point 10 feet past the southern boundary with three Boston Way before the receipt of a final certificate of occupancy for three Boston Way. I believe that's the correct wording. Correct. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, I'll take a motion on that. So move, Bonnie, it's done. Okay, second. I'll second, Alden. Okay, Alden, thank you. And I'll call roll on approval. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Don? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. So that is taken care of. And thank you very much, Lou, for um, giving us your time tonight. Well, thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda, uh, mm -hmm. Andy will update us on um, not only the letter from the residents of Evergreen, which has been posted, but the um, potential resolution to the issue of the proposed fence, which we did discuss at our last meeting. And so this is an update on that. Andy. Okay, so uh, hopefully folks can see on my screen here uh, just a snapshot from our GIS system. Um, what I've highlighted here for that area of the city, including the Evergreen Project or the Port Place uh, Project, is uh, you can see obviously the new lots, the roadway, and the uh, open space areas. What I've highlighted is the number two well site for the city. Um, that's where we get some of our water supply. Um, so um, yeah, up at the top of the screen, actually, in the corner, you can almost see the, the structure there. Um, but that, that green highlighted parcel is the city's existing parcel. Um, what has been discussed with the development team, obviously, in this project and as part of the project, is uh, a larger open space parcel, uh, number one, and another open space parcel. It's a little bit of an awkward uh, configuration, but it wraps around the homes. And, um, and uh, if you'll notice here, there's a little sliver left over. Um, that creates this parcel A, and uh, for, for those of you who weren't on the board uh, at the time this project was approved, um, that parcel was carved off uh, and created because the city um, had some vested interest in protecting the well, and the uh, development team was able to provide the uh, commonly uh, assumed radius that the municipality would own around the well uh, in the open space area. So the agreement during the time of permitting was that that, that portion of the open space would be conveyed to the city. Uh, the fee interest. So that is in process, but um, there was an issue that came up, which was um, the water department and the conservation commission um, had determined that there was some dumping going on. Um, and I don't know the whole history of that. I would defer to those folks on, on the details, but um, their concern was making sure that there was a barrier for uh, to indicate to folks and make sure that uh, we were preventing as much as possible dumping on the, the number two well site or even the parcel uh, A, which is the sliver you're seeing here, that would effectively be conveyed to the city and added to the number two well site uh, in terms of the water divisions uh, oversight. And so the, the question here was um, whether or not to place a, a uh, split rail fence, if you will, around the arc um, that you see on that, that parcel. And the more recent discussion of that, to summarize it all for you, is um, the residents had expressed some concern. I think the letter reflects it. Uh, some concern about the location of that fence um, and uh, its placement there. There are some other fences out there today um, just to uh, give you another image here. This is actually a photograph from that area. Um, you can see the lawn space. You can see a, a very shallow sort of swale there uh, and then a berm going up uh, that leading to the number two uh, well site. So that parcel is kind of a, an arc in there. Um, but there's not really a clear line between what is the homeowners association open space uh, to be preserved versus the parcel A that's the city's. 
Um, and there was some concern there about folks, um, uh, whether it's from the development team or the residents or both, um, having some dumping going on on the city property behind there. Uh, it's not atypical for uh, municipalities to find um, yard waste and so forth dumped uh, across uh, lot lines. So um, the concern here, the crest was a split rail fence. Uh, the residents expressed concern about that additional fence. I think there's, there's a number of fences already out there, as you can see on the uh, left side of the image uh, a little bit. Um, there are some other fences already around some of the yards. So I, I guess it might have been a sort of aesthetic perception that's too many fences. Uh, and so um, there was a discussion in the last couple of days about uh, shifting that fence out of that area and actually along the tree line um, so that it's, it's sort of hidden, if you will, uh, make it four, four feet tall as opposed to sort of a, a taller six foot fence, um, but uh, four foot and then sort of a brown coated, vinyl coated uh, to kind of blend into the background. Um, and part of the reason for that was the uh, water department, when we were talking with Department of Public Services and Phil Christensen, the planning board's consulting engineer about the stormwater management for this project, um, during the course of uh, design and then development of this project, the, um, the, the maintenance of the swale uh, in that area and the grass in its present condition um, was, was acknowledged to be something that's important to make sure that the drainage works properly on the site um, per the uh, developer's original plans, right, to, to prevent there being any problems. So, um, so there was sort of agreement that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have a fence in there um, when you have to get vehicle in there to do some mowing and so forth. Um, and um, so there was sort of agreement that there was a, um, a logic behind moving that fence back um, and having it kind of blend or disappear, if you will, into the tree line where um, I think it's, it's less likely that folks would be dumping something in the open. Um, and so that was the, uh, the sort of assumption here. So my understanding is that sort of a reasonable sort of compromise between all the parties about this issue that the, um, you know, we want to make sure folks aren't dumping on the, the water department land. Um, and that's kind of the latest and greatest of that issue. I'm happy to expand on that if anybody has any questions. And we're assuming the developer, by the way, is going to come back with that uh, modification well with the I-95 uh, path connection. So in the coming weeks or months. So at this point, this is just for our information. And if we have any concerns or um, um, questions for the applicant, we'll address those when they bring in the minor modification. Is that the plan? That's exactly correct, Bonnie. Yeah, the um, we... We didn't want to deprive the board of the communication that had come in. Uh, we knew that there was some concern from the residents about this issue. So um, even though uh, we might typically package information on a subject matter for the agenda it's on, uh, we didn't want to wait for that, even though um, the formal request from the development team to deal with this detail has not come in yet. Anything really pressing that anybody has to have answered on this right now? Okay, great. Well, thank you for the update, Andy. And that sounds like it's a reasonable solution. We'll learn more about how reasonable it sounds to the residents when uh, the application comes through. So we'll move on to approval of the minutes for May 19th. May I have a motion to approve? Make the motion, Bonnie. Thank you, Don. Second? I can second that, MJ. Thank you, MJ. Uh, any discussion? Then I'll call the roll for approval of the motion. Um, Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Rick? Abstain, I wasn't present. Okay. MJ? Yes. Don? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. So those minutes are approved. And as I said, we'll wait till the next meeting for um, the minutes of. Um, June 2nd. So um, now, yes. Bonnie, Bonnie, I'm sorry, this is Andy. I just wanted to note, um, the we have sort of the unusual situation with Zoom meetings where the, the visual cues aren't uh, quite as obvious, but um, we had a, a gentleman in the audience who had raised their hand just for the audience. If there's anybody who's curious, tonight's agenda doesn't have or include any sort of public comment period because there aren't any uh, uh, items that are, are hearings or so forth. Um, the planning board had planned on having discussions um, related to some uh, particular long range agenda items. Um, so that's the reason for that. If in case anybody's wondering or, or raising their hands, I'll defer to the chair on any other, um, you know, uh, comments or concerns. But uh, just in case anyone else is raising their hand, thanks. Thank you for that clarification. Correct. We only have public comment on um, public hearings, um, and by exception on um, complex or otherwise difficult to understand um, other issues. So tonight really was scheduled as just a planning discussion among the board members, and I'd like to stick with that agenda. 
So um, I apologize to anybody who feels they wanted to say something um, about something we've already talked about. But um, as I said, the if it has anything to do with Evergreen, we'll be back on that at another time. Um, and if not, um, um, a letter to the planning board, uh, care of the um, planning office um, could be sent. Okay. Our planning discussion is going to begin with a review of the site plan review, a discussion of the site plan review section of our zoning ordinance. Um, this was um, selected because it's on the uh, project for rewriting our entire zoning code. And we felt that it would be more helpful to the planning staff if we talked about one section that um, we have a lot of experience with, that they could use our comments uh, on when they do get to the point that they are ready to revise this section of the ordinance. Um, let me just say that tonight is an opportunity to say anything you need to about site plan review. We will go through it sec subsection by subsection. Um, the planning office will be taking notes. Linda's gonna be keeping the minutes. It's obviously gonna be on the recording. So this is for future incorporation into um, the revision. Um, but anything that you want to see in site plan review, and if you think that a section might refer to some other part of the ordinance, the overall zoning code. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Where it fits, just get your comments in there. That's the most important thing. We're not going to get tied up into knots about where things fit or the exact language. We'd just like to get the information out. Um, with that in mind, I thought it would be easiest if we just go through it subsection by subsection. That being said, this would be the point where if you have any sort of overall comments about site plan review, um, this would be a good time to voice them. So let's just start with overall comments, if you have any. All right, um, then we will start with um, intent, if there's anything there that you want to um, say about site plan review getting out of the box, as it were. I might mention that, um, as everybody is well aware, site plan review is not a permit per se. It is um, more a review of the site specific issues that we'll be looking at as we go through the various subsections. Um, and I guess that's all I want to say about that, which is different from what we normally do, where we approve or approve with conditions or deny. Um, in this case, we do review, work out with the applicant how they can meet the criteria um, in site plan review. And it's usually attached to some other uh, permit that they are seeking or have. Yeah, and it's usually done in conjunction with that, just as background. Okay, let's go to purpose. Any comments on that? Um, Bonnie, I would note, by the way, that there was a meeting earlier today with the Resiliency Committee, and they had asked um, if, it, if anyone isn't mentioning this. Uh, uh, David Chadfield and the committee members were interested in us trying to incorporate any resiliency uh, criteria. So to the extent that that comes in to play as another bullet or um, a comment, feel free to note that as well. Okay, um, would that um, be a good thing to mention somewhere? Um, don't know exactly what the language would be right here in the purpose, or is that I think that's, I don't, I don't want to make a, an assumption that that is just um, one of the criteria we'll add later on or one of the subsections. Did you bring it up at this point because you felt like it should uh, also fit into? I, 
Thank you. Yeah, I did actually, I would suggest perhaps if it's not its own bullet, and I don't have a strong preference, but um, uh, where it goes, but if I would suggest for purposes, maybe adding it to the land use planning bullet or a separate one right underneath there. Um, and I, I do think it would make sense to reference here that way. Um, it's always helpful when you have criteria in an ordinance to um, point back to a purpose, original uh, public purpose that's being served by it, because if there's litigation over criteria, uh, especially something more progressive like sustainability or resiliency issues um, that are newer provisions, um, then uh, it's always helpful to point back to the public purpose part of the ordinance. I would agree with you, and I'd like to see it as a separate um, separate purpose statement and broaden it to sustainable development, resiliency, and energy efficiency or something to that effect, because Great. I actually wanted to add um, a new category later on that would cover all of that. So if we have it in the purpose, um, that's a good cross-reference. That's great. Thank you for uh, the additional phrasing, because I agree that those are all uh, in clear alignment. Anyone else want to comment on this or add to it, maybe? Like Don, who knows a lot about this? Bonnie, you, literally, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, <laughs> if we're going to change something and put in something about resiliency, and we should also consider some of the other items, i.e., uh, you know, our, our net zero or, or, or sustainability, et cetera. So I think you captured it perfectly, Bonnie. Good. Hey, Can I, I just like ask, does it, would it make sense to, in addition to referencing the 2001 master plan to also reference other reports that we want to? I agree. That's a great idea. Uh, thank you about the, um, there are other sections in the ordinances where we reference um, not only the council orders to adopt the ordinance, but also the ordinance itself. Sometimes we reference either the master plan or our so-called specific plan, like the resiliency plan that was recently adopted. So, uh, uh, you know, developed by the city. So I agree completely. We could add that phrasing to that bullet to reference those two specific plans as well. Actually, shouldn't it be 2017 master plan? This is the ordinance as it exists today. It is. I'm sorry, Beth. I didn't. Uh, I didn't note the year you had noted, but yes, you're yeah, right. Yeah. No. And I was going to recommend just having some language in there saying as updated, you know, periodically. I agree. Okay. Anything else on purpose? Andy, could you move us to the next section? Applicability. All right. I'll get us started. Um, what do you guys think about changing um, the determination for major or minor from five or more units to four or more residential units? Um, because five or more is, is limiting to just some rather large projects that are very um, few and far between. I'm wondering if capturing projects of four or more residential units would be um, appropriate. So Bonnie, um, this is Rick. I, there's an echo, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know if everybody else yeah, is, but- I do too. Um, I wonder, since you raised that point, uh, there, there's clearly a difference between single and two family dwellings and everything else. So I think, I mean, obviously anything is a, is a uh, arbitrary cutoff to a certain point. Um, and I guess the question is if we have, if we, if we use the cutoff as four or more, then we've got the singles and twos, which are by themselves, and then three, and then four or more. So, you know, it's almost, you could almost go to three or more. I guess, I don't know how many permits we have in each category, how many permits there are for three families, four families, and five or more families. It would be, you know, it would be helpful to know what the, um, what the implication would be for workload and for bringing people in. But I think there's, if you start thinking about four, I think there's, a, there's an argument to be made for three as well. And Rick, we could try to gather with the zoning administrator and the building office uh, some data. If you're if you're looking for some specific uh, breakdowns, we can try to get some data um, yeah. from their you know their sources. Obviously, I know. I, just as a comparison, when we redid the the, um, the site plan regulations in Portsmouth, um, I think it was 
five or more, and they decided to go to, it was before I was actually working as a planner there, but they decided to go to three or more because they found that there were so many three and four family developments, and those were the ones that were causing the most headaches in terms of making sure the development was good. So I don't know whether that's the case here or not. I mean, I don't think we have nearly the level of development that, that Portsmouth had, so I'm sure it's not, not the same situation. But uh, I think it'd be interesting to look at to see whether four is the right cutoff or whether it should be three or five. Other Bonnie, comments? Did, yeah. did you have a reason for four? Uh, I just thought five was too much and I only dropped it to four, but as I think about it um, with your help, three or more. Um, we have a lot of small developments and we're more likely to have three and then we can get into site plan review on these issues. I'm just wondering if site plan review is overkill on a project of three units. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing, I, that's where I would want some more experience um, with how this plays out because we really don't want to be overly regulating. So yeah. we need to know that there's enough of a potential problem that three or more makes sense. Otherwise I'd say four just because, well, I think about Hancock Street and I'm trying not to just focus on the most recent projects, but um, there are likely to be more fours than fives and um, more, disrupt more disruptive. This is Andy. I would also note, by the way, that um, one of the things that Jennifer and I see, um, you know, in thinking about these types of things is ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, oftentimes will end up having some of those uh, small scale projects before them because they'll fall out in the uh, more denser areas of the city. Um, so um, that that is also another oftentimes a review or, or uh, protection of some type, at least for the review of what's going on there. Right. But how much... How much do they get into stormwater management and um, lighting? And those are sort of the obvious things, but um, design, other things that site plan review um, looks at. Sure, um, it's a valid point you make. And mainly I would say is not because they don't have some authority to look at those things with the type of relief that is being requested because oftentimes it's a special permit for non-conformities um, to make a modification or, or variance. And then um, the, the board, I think in more recent time has been starting to look at the types of site conditions, landscape conditions um, uh, as, type of, as parts of their review. They in the past, um, to your point, Bonnie, haven't looked at some of those details uh, a lot, uh, like the, the way that the planning board has. And they have the ability, though, in, their, in the granting of relief to look at those details. And um, so you raise a valid point, which is they don't necessarily look at all the site details. They tend to look at more at the structure involved. Um, but they have been in more recent time looking at the neighborhood effects and things like landscaping. Um, I know from a stormwater perspective, um, the, um, the, you talk with the city engineer, there's sort of a 10,000 square foot um, um, uh, threshold in which you need a stormwater permit from, from the Department of Public Services or DPS, um, but they tend to think that the smaller scale projects aren't the, um, the the ones sort of worth pursuing, if you will, from a stormwater management perspective. Well, I, I would just like the staff to look at closely if you, when you consider three or more rather than four or more, if even four or more is acceptable, that we're not overly regulating um, with with uh, requiring site plan review at that um, level of um, development. Okay, other um, comments about um, applicability. I guess one comment um is a thousand square feet of construction really a major project I mean, a thousand square feet is you know a very small dwelling unit so um i don't know whether that whether that makes sense or whether we should increase that one yeah I, rick i agree completely with that one i do think in today's day and age i don't you know i have to go back to the date this was reviewed at 2002 but even then a thousand square feet isn't a significant amount and it's interesting that the minor project threshold is five thousand square feet 
less than 5,000 square feet. So I, I almost wonder whether 5,000 square feet should be the, um, the threshold for a, uh, for a major project. Yeah, I, I would concur. I, I would note, by the way, that um, I don't need to go into the details of it, but um, it's sort of minutiae. But one of the things that um, Jennifer and I have talked about, and I've noticed, uh, you know, the time that I've been here is the major projects A and the minor projects B. They don't um, they don't necessarily capture everything, right? So it's a little bit um, um, there's a little bit of inconsistency sort of between the way they're treated. I think Rick's pointed out uh, one of them that might be something we could reconcile better, but. Um, but I agree with the, the threshold adjustment. There was something that I saved from um, Jennifer. Um, I don't remember in what relationship she brought it up, but she said that um, existing uses are not covered. So if there's any, um, if there's a, a modification to the site with no addition of square footage, they're not covered at all. So she was recommending that we add under major um, for existing uses, any modification of the site, even if they're not adding square footage would um, trigger site plan review. And I'd like to put that in there as a, spa as a space holder for her to clarify that when the time um, comes for you all to review this. In any modification of the site? Yeah. So if they're doing something inside um, that, um, I don't know, could add to drainage issues, I don't know. Anyway, she, she just felt like, or more traffic. So she was talking about curb cuts. She had a list of things that she felt could be affected. Parking, mm -hmm. um, they might be, but somehow she felt like that was um, enough of a concern, and she can't be here tonight to, to clarify it, um, that we should put something in there to um, cons at least consider. So that's that would be you know, kind of a placeholder to say, yeah. come back and look at this and see what kinds of site changes would require site plan review. Yeah, it might even be another number five under A mm. with some clarification. It needs some language, definitely. So would this, how would this relate to that project that we saw over a period of a couple of months on High Street backing out of Otis Place? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Where they were changing the the surfacing and landscaping of the parking area. Yeah, I mean, we we looked at all the relevant issues without actually doing an official site plan review. Sort of like what Andy was saying with um, the ZBA looking at nonconformities, and they could expand it any time because they have the authority to do that. Um, what was our authority to look at that? Why did that come before us? If, we, if it wasn't, it was a modification. It was a it was a modification to a previous decision on the building. Okay, so like a special permit modification. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we picked it up anyway. I think I just you know, in courtesy to Jennifer to make sure she gets this in there if she needs it. If she thinks it's an important enough to have sent a note and I saved it, I just want to put it in there um, as a placeholder. Okay. Okay, this meeting is not just Rick and me talking to Andy and everybody <laughs> nodding their heads. If you really don't have anything to say, don't don't take up airspace, obviously, but I don't want you to be put off and I don't know any other way to do it other than to just say it. Um, so chime in when you have something you'd like to say. Um, shall we move on to review procedure then under 15D? Yes. I bet everybody's going to agree with me on this one, or at least have something to say. Why do we keep the pre-application? Oh, I'm sorry. Why do we do the completeness vote on applications if the staff make all the determinations? We've rolled our eyeballs on this enough. Um, 
is there some justification for that or can we just drop the whole thing and what do people um, feel about that for the office we certainly have no problem and agree with that bonnie anybody going to fight me on dropping completeness votes so where where is the completeness vote let's see i don't know i just did a bullet under there it must be in there somewhere yeah it's one of the procedures uh, um, maybe farther down Uh, where is it here? Oh, pin number two. I'm sorry, number two. Yep. But I would like to retain the option for the planning board to request further information during the public hearing process. So please don't throw out that baby with the bathwater. Um, yes, yes, agreed. Because there could be, wa uh, well, not waivers, but there could be further information that we need, like traffic reports are a good example we decide that it's more critical than they thought it was and we want a traffic report. So we need to be able to ask for other information as we go through the public hearing process. Agreed. So um, just to be clear, if, um, I mean, there are certain things that are listed as required in an application and presumably if we held a completeness at a hearing or meeting, then we could waive any required submissions at that point. But the staff doesn't have the authority to waive any, any uh, required submissions. So um, if somebody didn't want to submit, for example, a full traffic report, because they felt, you know, like the other people we've, we've talked to haven't, um, haven't felt that their project was big enough to require a traffic report, and or what is a community impact report, whatever it is. And um, so if they they could not come, they would still it would still be the equivalent of a completeness meeting, right? Because they would have to come to us to request permission not to submit it, and then wait another meeting until they actually until we actually scale through the hearing, because they wouldn't know whether we were going to agree to their request, um, and until until they talk to us about it. Is that is that correct? Yes, Rick, actually, that's 100% correct. And actually, it's uh, consistent with an amendment that's part of the current package that we're uh, making some tweaks to that's uh, before the council, um, which has a, a provision in there speaking to the fact that applications need to be complete. Um, what we call out in there, and I think we might be tweaking the language a bit, but uh, it basically says, in essence, um, you, to your point, um, it doesn't matter whether it's only ZBA or the planning board, um, you need to ask for the waiver in advance. But uh, if you've got that waiver from the board or the you know, department as it may be applicable, um, you, can, you can then proceed to your application before the board. In the case, like you pointed out here, um, staff uh, would not have the authority to waive that requirement, and, uh, but we could, um, to Bonnie's point, we certainly could save the board some time by um, when it's a complete application per the ordinance, um, you know, processing the application and getting it on your agenda for a hearing rather than um, throwing it on your agenda to have you effectively vote what we've determined in the office, which is that it has all materials the ordinance calls for. Well, could we do it by, could we do it by exception? In other words, um, there is no completeness vote. Um, the staff reviews the application. And if the applicant is requesting waivers, um, could we vote on those in the first meeting? What I'm trying to avoid is all those long drawn out reviews with some of the applicants who have very um, detailed oriented planners um, on their staff uh, hired to present. So they go through this, they go through the whole application presentation to help us understand why they need the waivers. So I'm trying to avoid, that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So that's why I'm suggesting that staff review it and then by exception, bring to us an application before it's complete um, on their end because they wanna request waivers. And then they would know that and they wanna know that before they come in to talk to us about the whole thing. So. That's, I think that's what I'm saying, uh, Bonnie. I think that if we if we get it do away with the completeness uh, vote, then any application that is complete goes right to a public hearing. But if somebody 
wants to have a less than complete application, they would then have to come to a separate meeting to get our approval to receive it. Is that, is that what you're saying? Right, except that we then have to go through the whole application to understand why they want the waiver or effectively, you know, if, if they were really good at summarizing, they could do it in half the time. So I'm trying to avoid that. Is it um, inappropriate to actually open the public hearing and if they wanna request waivers to do it at that time as part of the presentation, the first presentation of their full application? So, so Bonnie, this is Don. Um, I, we may all be saying the same thing, but I vividly remember, perhaps incorrectly, but I believe correctly, uh, this was with one of the applicant's attorneys, is that if we vote a package they, they for, for completeness, and if they're requesting waivers, we can still vote the, the application complete, and it does not prevent us once we open the hearing to say, well, even though we, we, we said that you didn't need a traffic study, or, or we said without, you, you put a waiver in for a traffic study as part of your application, but we now, but we now want that traffic study. I was under the impression we were not precluded from doing that. Correct, correct. But this is, this is the first, the prior step to that, which is if their application includes three or four waivers, the staff do not have the jurisdiction, the authority to approve those waivers. So they have to well, bring them to us. But they're, they're, they're approving, they're, they, they, well, first of all, we, we could put something in, in here, right? we're still discussing that, but, but I was under the impression, or I would be okay with the staff approving that these waivers are acceptable to be viewed as application completeness. And then when it comes to us, the applicant is at their, their risk and we say, well, you know, we now want this information, but this way it doesn't have to come before us with an application completeness review, it just comes when the application is there. Yeah. Yep, you just said it better than I did. That's yeah. really what I want. And I don't know if that's procedurally um, um, desirable or even legal to do. And does it cause us potential problems down the road? Andy, Rick, you it, have more experience. It, it, yeah, it's just the mechanics of how you go about doing it. Uh, you, you can prevent it from being an issue and we can talk in more detail uh, as need to be about, you know, situations like that. But um, you can certainly avoid, I think, some of the issues you're discussing. So you could, uh, to Don's point, speed up the review process and not uh, waste time on your meetings for something staff can determine is complete. Um, and yet, at, to Bonnie's point, um, you can... Um, you can, you know, reduce the amount of time they're presenting before the board because uh, if they do have to come in and ask for a waiver, uh, which the ordinance would call them to go to the board for, um, they can be required to provide a brief overview of their project. Uh, and then to, to Bonnie's point, you don't need to review the entire application. You just need to know the, the rationale for the, the granting of the waiver in that particular project. Um, and then um, to uh, the Point you were just making a second ago, uh, as long as you make it clear uh, at the outset when you're granting the waiver at the beginning um, for the submission, that's just to allow the clock to start ticking in the application. So the only reason we, we talk about this completeness vote is we don't want the, cl the clock to be ticking, uh, staff to be wasting time on an application, legal um, requirements to be moving ahead in terms of the board having to take a vote um, if the application, if the applicant hasn't even provided you adequate information. So in this case, um, you could um, specify that just for the purposes of a complete application, um, you're waiving the submission for of a, let's say, a traffic study uh, based on the, the project parameters, but the board reserves the right to uh, call for such a traffic study during the hearing uh, if it's a later determines. So it's really just, I think, a mechanics of how you clarify that when you're, when you're doing it. Okay. Everything. I, yeah, go ahead. Just raise my concern. My only concern is, so when this completeness determination is made, whether by us or by the staff, it starts the click kick uh, yeah, the clock. of the clock. Sorry. Um, so I, I just want, I would want to make sure that there's a process in place so that it has to be some sort of formal determination and we know when the clock starts ticking or the staff does. Um, 
you know, I think with a vote, it's clean and then we know. Um, but if somebody, you know, says offhand in the office, you know, yeah, it's complete. We don't want that to constitute the beginning of the ticking of the clock, I guess. So I would just want to make sure that there's some procedure in place so that the planning office is keeping track and has a, you know, set process for yes, making that's those determinations. Yes, we, we agree on that uh, 100%. So, so here's yeah, a compromise. We maybe have a protocol where we document what, what the dates are that things have been reviewed or approved. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's a maybe a compromise or a middle ground position. What if instead of having a, a separate meeting to have the completeness vote, when, it's some, when we had something on the agenda, actually, this is how we did it in Portsmouth, uh, you, have a, you had a vote on the completeness of the application and then another vote to open the public hearing. It could be the same night. And so that would be, that would prevent you from ticking, start, starting the clock ticking um, if you had a, if you felt there was a serious deficiency in the application. Um, um, yeah, and Rick, Rick, we could do it that way. But again, I don't know that we're accomplishing very much more than it's sort of resulting in the same situation, which is that you've decided um, to either grant a waiver or not. And, and if it meets the ordinance criteria for submission, it's not really clear why the board has to spend time on that administrative action or that uh, you know, uh, voting, if it's really an administrative act, whether or not it meets the requirements of the ordinance. Well, the requirements of the ordinance have a specific list of things and there's a waiver to waive one of those items. I mean, I, I, I don't, maybe it's not a, as big a deal as it seems to me, but it seems like there's, it opens us up to starting the clock ticking on something that might be a, you know, might be contentious. Well, we won't know if it's contentious until we hear the application and their yeah. rationale for not, for asking for the waiver, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to, you know, avoid as a double presentation. Um, if the clock starts ticking, when the staff have said it's complete and have set up uh, a date for the first public hearing, um, they can always ask for a continuance mm -hmm. if they run out of time because of some major disagreement on a particular waiver request. I, I'm just noticing that on section 15F is about the waiver of submission requirements, uh, which comes after this whole review procedure it seems like it's out of order. And maybe that's where I'm getting hung up because I was looking at that section we were looking at, which has got a process for completeness. But how can you have a completeness review if you, if you wait till section 15F to, to look at waivers? So maybe that's, maybe it's what needs to happen is somehow um, merge section 15F back into section 15D so that it's clear what the process is for granting waivers. Because the planning board has to grant the waiver. It's clear, it's clear that you know, the, the, plan, the planning staff can determine that a waiver is appropriate, but it can't approve the waiver. The planning board has to approve the waiver. So it seems like that maybe moving section 15F back up to 15D would make that all clearer. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, under hmm, eight, what was eight? C eight was back up under review procedures. Um, Bonnie, if I could, I just uh, before we move on from the point that Rick was making. Yeah, oh, I thought we were done. Sorry. Sorry, no, my apologies. I was trying to uh, pull up a section here from the recent amendment that we have uh, that we're looking at before the council, um, just because it goes to uh, Rick's point. Um, there are a couple of sections in the ordinance that, that overlap each other in terms of what they're dealing with, um, to Rick's point. And uh, one of the provisions that we put in the uh, rewrite packages before the council right now is this bullet that you should be seeing at the top. Um, and we talked about tweaking some of the language in here from, from what's currently before the council a little bit. I think we talked about rephrasing a bit, but uh, the bottom line is, um, I guess our hope was to try to consolidate to Rick's point, um, that F and D section um, into really just one section of the ordinance that deals with the administration part 
Um, uh, but at any rate, um, we're happy to, to do it anywhere, but we, we agree that consolidating that point uh, for waivers into one section makes more sense. Yeah, but this now, the way this is stated is the old way, which is before we can, can accept a formal submission, all waivers have to be approved. And that's back to what we were doing. So that's the section would have to change if, if we're in agreement that waivers can be heard at the first hearing of the formal application. Right, but if you, if, if I understood Rick's point, uh, requiring or having those done the night of the hearing, part of the reason why some folks ask for the waiver in advance is because they might need time to prepare one of those submissions if, it, if the board determines it's required. So, um, you know, traffic studies, for instance, uh, sometimes take some time. So I think that part of the reason why um, from the applicant's perspective, they like the ability to find out whether or not the board needs that so they can have time to prepare it. Um, whereas if you hold off on making that determination until the night of the hearing, um, you're still doing the same thing, which is determining whether or not to grant the waiver, um, but you've not allowed the most amount of time for the adjustment that, that someone might want to make in, in preparing an adequate package. Right. So is there going to be change to this wording that we're looking at right now if you decide to go for, I mean, if you we're doing the mini this this piece is part of the joint public hearing that's up right now right on the mini reform right exactly so we we're, we want to basically merge this conversation we're having right now literally into the the amendment that's before the council if you will to rick's point um so that it is consistent to what we're talking about right now for sections f and d of site plan review um you know we want to basically make sure they're consistent to, to your point and to rick's so wherever you end up and wherever we end up in this dialogue you want to make that verbiage consistent and not have inconsistent verbiage in any other section. Right. So we're going to have this discussion about waivers and application procedure around section 12B. Correct, right. Oh, no, it's section, I'm sorry, yeah. section 10D. Uh, yes, number 10D. 10D, it's yeah. 10D. So that has to be brought up in our next joint public hearing. So, so this section, I, this just went right over my head when we talked about it at the last public hearing. Yeah. What was what is the what's the um, reason for adding this? Because this sounds like this is even stricter than our current site plan review because it says that they you can't come to us until you have an approved waiver, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, th this is actually, I mean, a lot of this is actually consistent with the way the ordinances should be in, uh, implemented and um, interpreted and applied today already. So mm -hmm. the, this, essentially, you know, this if you looked at the staff and said, all right, we have some, let's say there was a complete disconnect between boards and staff, the board arguably would not want staff to be stamping in an application and running the clock from the city clerk's office um, on, on timeframes to decisions and so forth, if an application does not call for or does not have in it what the ordinance mm -hmm. calls for. So um, we're just trying to make it clear to applicants that um, there should be no expectation that, that staff or boards are gonna be spending time on applications that don't meet the minimum requirements of your application forms or the um, call outs in the ordinance for, for whatever the application or permit may be. Um, in this instance, we're just noting here that if you want to submit an application and avoid the requirements of the ordinance, you should ask the board first um, so that the clock is not running and the, because that otherwise you, the board could potentially be penalized um, for, for uh, you know, that, that situation. So it makes more sense to me to, uh, if everybody knows what the rules of the roads are, are and what the requirements are, they adhere to that and they submit. And if they want an exception, it's not unreasonable for them to meet with you two weeks in advance to ask for the waiver um, so that, that, that uh, your clock is not running essentially against you. But, but that's just what we're saying we don't want to do. I mean, how's that? How's that? that's, what we, that's what we've been talking about. The fact that if they submit a request for a waiver, we have to listen to the, a good portion of their, their application presentation um, in order to determine whether or not the waiver is required. We could say, no, you don't need, we'll accept your waiver, go put forth your formal application, and then we have to listen to it all over again. So. I'm still not understanding 
why we can't deal with waivers once we get started with the permitting process. And if there needs to be an extension, we agree to that because they need more time to submit um, a well, I, I, I think you're going to end up with more conflicts and debates and time spent at meetings on legal interpretation and, and, and debates over that issue than you would with spending, um, to your point, the applicant does not deserve necessarily an entire night of presentation if they need to ask for a waiver. You can simply say to them when they come in to ask for a waiver in advance of the submission of the application, um, you have five minutes to present your overview of your the scope of your project and why you think a waiver is appropriate. And if, if they can't summarize that in a short amount of time, um, I, don't, I don't know that you need a full application presentation. I can't recall one where that was needed, but, um, but I don't think you need that level of detail to know whether or not, for instance, the scale of a project calls for a traffic study or not. Would somebody else weigh in on this? Because I don't agree with that. I think by the time we get all the information we need, um, we're just back to where we started from. And if that's the case, and if we need to approve waivers before the formal submission of the application, then let's just leave everything the way it is. And I'll, this conversation has been enlightening, but I can't make an argument to get rid of it because it's not legally possible, I guess. I, I think procedurally, there's something we could do to make it better, which is if we haven't opened a public hearing, we don't have to hear from the applicant. The applicant can give us a written request and we basically make our determination based on that written request. Could we ask for a couple of comments on clarification if we wanted it and keep them on a If track? we wanted to, if we wanted to, but you know, we could, we could, it might be just this, the most efficient thing and to force them into actually being clear is to say, you know, this is not a public hearing because I think that once you start having that back and forth, then you get the public involved. You could get the public involved, and we don't want to do that. So I would suggest that, you know, if we want to have, if we want to deal with a waiver, because I understand that we could, we could be backing ourselves into a corner by accepting an application um, without this, this not complete and starting the clock ticking. Um, but if we just if we just have the applicants submit it in writing and we make our determination based on a written request. Yeah, and that's literally what this says here. So we would be consistent with this first um, submission for mini reform. So yeah. clean up the site plan review statement that says is consistent with this. Yeah. That way we have more control over what they can say because if we ask for it we'll get it. we'll get what we deserve <laughs> and if we can just look at the written application whether they're in the room or not and make a determination then we're done and they can come back with their formal submission when they're ready All right, that was a lot of words to get to that point, but I think we got it. So let's go back to site plan review. Thank you, Rick. Um, and just note that definitely need to merge the two sections that we talked about earlier and um, clarify that it needs to be in, the waiver request needs to be in writing. Understood, yep. Okay. There was one other, yeah, did, are we ready to move on? Sure, I wasn't sure which section you wanted to uh, pick up with at this point. Uh, well, I'm still here. There's um, a section C. Okay. Where am I? Uh, back in, I think I'm still in D review procedure. Is there a section C? Yeah, there is. There's something I've never done before and I never heard of it. Um, do we ever use the option to request a joint public hearing with the ZBA? And if and why is it in here? And do we want to keep it? Yeah, I can frankly not recall a time when that's been done in the time that I've been here. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know. I can't think of many instances in which that would end up aligning. Uh, we certainly see applicants occasionally going back and forth between the two boards based on the jurisdictions uh, that each might have on a project. Um, but I haven't, can't say that I've used it, seen this provision used thus far. Uh, I certainly have no objection. It's like the city council meeting with the planning board and 
discussing a zoning change together, that, that might end up um, having some beneficial overlap in the discussions. Um, but uh, I have never seen this provision really used. I think it's C8 if you want to scroll down and people will know what we're talking about. Yeah. Where the zoning boards of appeal and the permit granting authority for special permit or use variance, the planning board may request a joint public hearing. Now we've, I mean, again, Hancock Street, that worked out fine. They just went back and forth. I don't know if it would have saved any time if we had all been there together, but um, I think the jurisdictions were, were separate enough, but they had to, the decisions had to be coordinated. So I just assume pull this out. I just don't see any point for it unless somebody else does. Right. I would agree. And, and frankly, there's nothing precluding uh, either board from asking the other to coordinate on the, the night of a hearing. So. Yeah, right, yeah. So in, in that regard, look at the next one. The next one assumes that we can grant site plan approval before a variance is granted. And I don't think that's appropriate at all. I think that, I think that the variance should happen before site plan approval. Well, what we did the last time with Hancock Street was we started talking. Well, no, that was that wasn't site plan review. But this one says in order to apply for a variance, you have, it has a that has a an a site plan approval. You submit the approved site plan. Yeah, I would agree. With it, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. The, the, because effectively the planning board wouldn't be in a position to prove uh, to approve approve a site plan that needed a variance and hadn't yet obtained one. So uh, I would agree. I think that language should be adjusted the way Rick says. I would, I, I think you should just delete that section. Uh, yeah, frankly, it's not really necessary. The operation of the other pieces of the ordinance and the permits that are required effectively makes those things jive in, in a way that, as you point out, this provision doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, anything else in this section? The E, materials for review. Anything there for anybody? Uh, this is MJ. I had one question at uh, under five, um, further down 5.1. Uh, there. Um, exterior material, including trim and colors. I don't think we actually have a right to say what colors things are. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. We've got a lot more important things to deal with, right? Well, and anybody can always just repaint whatever they want. And it's not something we've ever asked for them if they just submit line drawings we don't necessarily get colored renderings Ooh, you know. guess what we did that on boston way we had quite a discussion about that well, that's true yeah. i would say there are certain instances in which you might want to retain the ability the right to take a look at those details i would agree um to the point that was just made that in the case of the zba or even historical districts there's oftentimes the, the limit stops at you know colors right um and that that's you know the owner's dis discretion if you will but um, but I think in this case, given that you're seeing sometimes these uh, site plan review pieces come with architectural review for, say, the downtown or some other area of the city, like the 40-yard district, or, uh, of course, that has a, a whole section of ordinance debated, devoted to it, but um, even the Story Avenue area, you may want to make sure that things um, jive a little better, even though that's something that um, you might want to use a lot of caution looking at. It probably doesn't come up in the little ones, but something as big right. as Boston Way it was in our face. Yeah, I agree with you, Bonnie. Obvious. Yeah, so I guess we ought to hold on to it. But good point, because we probably just don't bother about it um, in the smaller ones. Right. Or even require it. Yeah. Okay, here's an interesting thing. Look at six. Elevations or renderings of new construction, renovation, or expansion, or model may be provided at the option of the applicant. Why not at the option of the planning board? What I would agree. Don't <laughs> want that. that like came right at me. Yeah, that seems to make sense. 
I yeah. would even go so far as to say require the elevations as normal, but the board may at its discretion call for a 3D or even in this case, depending on the scenario, just yeah. Like, yeah. Definitely. I mean, Waterfront West was an example of um, where we really wanted to see the model and be able to play around with it a bit, so. Yeah, good point. Well, that'll be an improvement. Boy, it really, <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you. I mean, I, I zip through these things when, when, when we have an application, but this has forced me to really look at it um, a lot more closely, which means that the next time we have an application, heaven help them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be really well prepared on site plan review, even if these issues don't get, you know, resolved into rewrites at the moment, we can still use this knowledge. Okay, what else here on submitted materials for review? Well, there's a, um, there's kind of a disconnect, I think, between the materials submitted for review, which say the plan shall show, under five, the plan shall show pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular traffic flow patterns. And there's another place where it doesn't talk about bicycle, it just talks about pedestrian and vehicular. I was just trying to find that. It was a standard, I think. I can't remember. I just saw it. Um, oh, yeah, the, traffic yeah. impact, the traffic impact study under, under B4. So that, that just talks about pedestrian and vehicular. So I think that there's, so one of the things that we're asking them to show pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular, the, the traffic study should show traffic, pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular also. And then um, I don't know whether we want to say anything about trucks. What do you want to say about trucks? Well, it's oftentimes you require a, a truck turning template to show the trucks can, make, can actually make the turns. And I don't know whether we do that by informal requirement or whether there's a requirement whether we actually require them to provide that. I haven't, haven't noticed that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with Rick. We should probably call that out in here just as a baseline. But um, mechanically, what's happened is, and it's been pretty much consistency over the, the time that I've been here anyway, um, is the fire department, Steve Bradbury, um, will take a look at those turning movement plans, as would, say, Phil Christensen or the engineering department. Um, but we'll typically call for that uh, review with the fire department because they have the larger vehicles. Um, and um, and then provide comments to you or even uh, working with Phil early on in the process so that effectively the plan you end up with is one that um, the fire department feels like it can get a truck through. Um, so effectively, we have a way we're doing it. But to your point, maybe the ordinance should call that out as a required submission. If we if we have a way of handling it, I don't think we need to handle it in the regs because there'll be it's one of those things that they'll be asked for later on and they'll they'll provide. But I, I guess I just suggest that, um, that we have bicycle in both places, not only the submissions, but also the impact study. I 100% I agree with that. Anything else on um, materials for review? All right, moving on to G, site plan review criteria. Here we go. Our favorite one right at the top, community <laughs> character. Uh, this, this to, uh on each of the point I made uh, earlier on the resiliency committee mentioned today, um, this might be a place to add, like you were saying at the beginning, we, we mentioned the purpose section, the resiliency. If, uh, if we were to do that, I think it would make sense here to have one of the bullets speak to resiliency. Um, and we can, uh, I know that the resiliency committee members might be providing us, you, uh, the planning board and the office of planning development, some of their particular thoughts on what those bullets should be uh, based on our discussion earlier today. Yeah, I was going to suggest a new category G, sustainable development, and those words I used earlier as a placeholder. Um, it should also, I know resiliency people are going to um, provide some language, as you say, but I think we should also reference something like um, 
uh, league building ratings and decide which level of certification would be um, appropriate. There are various levels in there, and I think the minimal level is what's been stated but um, in the past, but I think we probably should go higher now that we're more into sustainable building. Um, and any other criteria that are used from the Energy Advisory Committee um, to get us to net zero energy goal by the dates um, agreed by the city. So all of that would go into that um, new category to build on what you were suggesting, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie, for mentioning that because I know that uh, to your point, the advisory, the uh, Energy Advisory Committee had asked for that very specific thing that that um, if we're making changes to the zoning provisions for the boards and what they review um, to try to pull in, like you said, um, you know, references to net zero expectations or lead or anything else that might be the appropriate standards. I know over the last couple of years, when I um, a couple of meetings that I've been there uh, with them um, for the subject matter, there were some discussions of what those requirements should be. Um, so it don't become um, impractical for people to incorporate in say smaller scale projects. Um, for instance, you may not be able to make a, a, a certain project net zero, but you might be able to show that um, you're making it as passive, you know, uh, as possible. Um, and then uh, using renewable sources, for instance, you know, for the, the actual grid uh, source. So, um, you know, they had some dialogue about that. They might have some thoughts and we can overlap here, but I uh, wholeheartedly agree with uh, capturing all of that underneath a new G. Uh, I also think um, adding to that is to determine what are absolute requirements and what are, um, you know, the difference between shall and may, uh, to your point, so that there are, now that we know more than we did a few years ago about what needs to be done, even in smaller projects, there uh, could be some absolute requirements that we want all of them to meet. And then um, the rest of them could fall into the may category, may meet, um, so that we can discuss it with them. Because right now, there's no teeth in it. And I think somebody brought that up at one of our meetings earlier that we can ask them, but they whittle, wheedle their way out of it all the time. So I think we just need a little more teeth in it. A little more teeth in, in what, body? In the, in the um, criteria and potentially in the performance standards, just like we were putting resiliency and sustainability in the purpose section, and we're adding it here. Um, in the criteria, I think we should also add it into the development and performance standards. And maybe what I just said is more appropriate there, where, yeah, um, yeah where, where there's certain things they must meet. Um, maybe we make some, and this is, you know, going to be done later on when staff get into this topic, but um, there may be some that are adjustable for different size projects, but are absolutes versus um, other requirements other um, standards that would be more flexible. Is, is that something that would go under the mandatory conditions in uh, 15L or do you think, it, or does it apply just to, um, you know, this part? This Actually, part and later on in H, development and performance standards, where you really have to tick the boxes. Yeah, uh, by the way, just to, for clarification, uh, the mandatory conditions section is actually meant to speak to uh, things that the boards are required to place as conditions on the projects, as opposed to what the board uh, earlier on, these earlier sections for site plan review criteria or performance standards, which is um, the applicant actually getting the board's approval um, for the plan they've proposed. So the, the performance uh, or the mandatory conditions are about the uh, or at least intended, was intended to be, um, you know, the planning board must place conditions addressing X, Y, and Z. Okay, thanks. Can we back up to community character um, 5A, or A5, I guess it is. Um, I'm suggesting that this statement um, is not helpful. It talks about being located within the National Historic District, consistent with architectural style, scale, et cetera. That district includes 2,200 structures. 
There's no. I agree. I think it's to say the neighborhood in context, right? Not the entire district. <laughs> That's right. So you've got that already. In six, is more about the neighborhood and the and the area surrounding it. You know, the the site and the area surrounding it, which could also use some adjusting. But five, I think, needs to come out. I think that was just not well thought out at all. I don't know who was smoking what when they put that in there. And uh, Bonnie, were you were you suggesting removing that or just tweaking yeah. the language? Oh. No, remove it. I don't think it's helpful. The historic district is a is a big area. We can use it for planning okay. purposes or whatever. We've got it in the master plan, but site plan review needs much more specificity. And I think you get that in six. And even there, we run into some trouble. I was talking to Rick about this earlier today. Um, <laughs> the immediate neighborhood and surrounding area sort of doesn't fly when you think about what we might want to do with Story Ave. Yeah, that would have, if, if we had followed that, we would never have allowed the institution for savings on Story Avenue because it certainly doesn't fit in with its surroundings, but it's the most beautiful building up there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> and I Sorry, remember I, I, um, when Nick was uh, negotiating with the, with the uh, Woodman Way tall buildings there that are different colored and have peaked roofs. I mean, his hands would have been tied if he had to do that. So we really need to think carefully about what this means. And we have enough experience now to know um, what won't work. Um, problem is what will work. Yeah. <laughs> and that varies by neighborhood and surrounding area. Um, that's the complication here, to find some language that will give us the um, authority to make something happen while the we have the flexibility to work area by area. Um, I, I'd just like to comment, I think in number six, it's like one long run in a sentence. It just seems like I think the things that you're saying, Bonnie, can be cleared up if we just kind of break that down a little bit better. It's just the language is very um, vague to me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And again, following up on what Bonnie said, you know, four, I think, is probably not, we probably don't want to have that in there. Um, unless we can rewrite it so it says what we, it's, it's in harmony with or better than <laughs> the, the architectural style of adjacent buildings. I, I would prefer to keep some provision in there at least, uh, but like to Rick's point, maybe adjust the wording, but but not to lose the essence, which is that yeah. you have the authority to look at the context. Well, we don't have to, I mean, if, if there's some key points you want to include, that's fine, but we don't need to spend time wordsmithing it tonight. Right, right. Um, do we want to move on to any other sections here? Um, anybody have input? I mean, um, Rick, you're already starting to talk about traffic parking and public access, um, that's where you wanted to add in bicycles in that section, or did I miss Actually, it? Actually, this is a different place too. There, there, so, there are three different places. <laughs> There's another one for you, just in case you didn't see it. it this is got it. This is okay. This is fine. Okay. Yeah. I think the criteria are, the, 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 the real strength of this is going to be in the development standards. Okay, well, if, if, that's a, if that's the point, then why don't we move on to development standards? Because that's what, what makes or breaks the effectiveness of our site plan uh, review decision. <coughs> Rick, I'm gonna let you take over. Well, I guess as, just a, as a general point, uh, the development standards here are a mix of standards and guidelines. You know, the standards are things that you have to do. So they have used the word shell and the guidelines are the things that should or um, there's some other words that are used here like that were feasible and so forth. Um, so I almost think that there should be a, a like an introductory paragraph and I'm not gonna write it now, but 
an indirected paragraph that says in the following section, things that say shall are standards that all developments must um, conform to, and things that say should are um, additional guidelines uh, that we're giving you to tell you what we'd like to see. Um, and you know, you'll, you'll see very quickly going through this that there uh, are quite a few um, sh shells, and then there are things that may or should and that kind of thing. So I just think it's, it probably should be um, clarified that this is not just standards, but it's standards and guidelines. Agreed. And that, that was actually a point when we talked about the 40-hour district. Uh, we actually had to, in yeah. order to match the district, we had to clarify those enough for the state to uh, feel that it was consistent with the act. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, Andy. Um, we, um, we've had experience doing that, so I don't see any problem with doing it here. And I like the idea of having an introductory paragraph because that sets the scene. And then that keeps us clean all the way through when those get changed. Any specific ones, Rick, that you wanted to pull out for discussion? I've got a ton of them. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> just, you know, just the more important ones. <laughs> um, so here's one, uh, a number A10. I think it's A10. Um, Yes. So this is one of those, those things. Except where physical constraints, site configuration, or safety considerations preclude strict compliance, no parking or loading shall be submitted, permitted within the required front yard setback. I would take out everything before the word no. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I can't imagine where there are issues. I was trying to imagine places in, in Newburyport where physical constraints would require you to have parking in the front yard, or safety considerations would require you to have parking in the front yard, parking and loading, no less. Um, and I, I really feel that that's, we could get rid of that whole loosey goosey language and just make it a strict standard. I agree. All right, um, let's think about an example. Um, down at um, the rotary, that five unit um, structure that replaced Leo's Pizza, mm -hmm. they argued that they wanted some parking in the front to show that they were in business. Right. That's um, that's that they couldn't get a waiver. They couldn't get a waiver under this provision. They would have because it wasn't site configuration, safety considerations, or or whatever else it was, physical constraints. It was just their desire to show parking spaces. So they could apply for a waiver and, and convince us that that was important. Well, there's a good question. There, there, that's, a, that's a, actually, thank you for raising it. It's a very fundamental question. I don't think there's any, any provision here for the planning board to grant waivers. This is, this is zoning. This is not uh, subdivision regulations. So uh, is there any, I didn't see any, any provision, and maybe I missed it, for the planning board to waive a zoning standard. No, but but no, but Rick's right about that. Um, I would suggest we, to Rick's point, I, I would suggest we carry a provision very parallel to the language we use in the 40-hour district, whereby the board can, if it so chooses and finds appropriate, grant a waiver from that um, provision rather than forcing uh, the effectively the ZBA to have to have a variance hearing on it. It can, the board planning board, it can itself decide whether or not that's appropriate to, to waive that provision. Yeah. yeah. And I would do it for all, all stand. If we're, gonna, if we're going to do it for a, a specific one, we might as well do it for everything to give the planning board the ability to waive it and, 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 and put some language that kind of makes that pretty narrow and says that it's, you know, points out that it's fairly narrow situations. Because I think that the, you know, when we did, to the point, to your point about that particular project, Bonnie, when we did our, our um, strategic land use plan, we had the buildings right up against the street. 
and the parking behind. Mm -hmm. And the by actually pushing the building back, we're just perpetuating this auto-oriented stuff. And um, it would have been nice if we had stronger language. So that would be added in the review procedure section back in D? I think it would be at the beginning of the development and performance standards section. Oh, you want it right there? Oh, yeah, because yeah. that's where it's most relevant. Yeah. So we're adding it, we would be adding language that distinguishes between standards and guidelines, and then also adding language that says in, in specific circumstances where it's demonstrated where the board finds that you know public purpose would be served or whatever, the board may waive uh, individual standards set forth in this section. Something like that. So just a question, I guess. So this um this wouldn't apply to a driveway if a driveway is coming in through the front setback. You're not right. saying you can't park in your driveway. You're talking well, about only... a parking area. Or... Right. This doesn't apply to single family homes, for example. And yeah. So yeah. it only, only applies to larger things. So this is really for commercial and multifamily developments. Right, right. So it would be for the just the driveway would come in. Yeah, because it really wouldn't work, you know, if you've got multi, even multi-residential. Back to our discussion of three or more, four or more, you wouldn't want to park in there with people, other people passing by you. Yeah, I think that'll hold. Um, does, I don't want to monopolize. If anybody else has anything that they'd like to say. Well, if you bring it up, then it'll, it could, um, stimulate other people to respond. So that so might at, help move us along. At the very end of B, the site plan and architectural design section, um, there is a provision that says the planning board may request dimensional and setback requirements. Um, that, that language is, is odd. Um, and I'm not really sure what to do with it or I would say it's a bit unenforceable or uh, usable as written, as currently written anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, it says the, the, the board may request, first of all, it doesn't say the board may require. Um, it also suggests that the board may effectively, um, you know, one might argue that without some due process require a, a further setback than the zoning, you know, the right. underlying zoning calls for. So I think it mechanically already has some issues in it as a provision. What would happen if we said may require you don't want to. I do don't it. think you can do that. That's because that's overriding the setbacks in the um, yeah in the yeah, zoning that. words. I think that I think that if in a case where there's a special permit attached to this, the planning board has the you know the clear ability to do that. You can under a special permit, you can certainly increase the setbacks. But for something that's an as of right use and it's just site plan review, and then this is, is not yeah. relevant. It shouldn't be yeah. in there. Right. I think you should delete this. Yeah. yeah, the only piece I would keep of this, and whether or not you keep it here or another section, uh, we can scroll through the list, but it, it's something that says, you know, the planning board may require additional landscaping or screening, some of that effect, just to, um, mm. yeah. But, but that would be under landscaping. That wouldn't be here. Agreed. Yeah, as long, yeah, as, long as you retain that somewhere, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Um, I think I missed something. There's a seven five about um, historical commission. Oh gosh, I, is there something that's just a seven and a small v for five? Because it's kind of um, important. It's um, uh, is that the one I have highlighted here, or uh... right? That's it. Yeah, right. That's wrong. Um, it's, it should be from the local historic di district commission, not the historical commission. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All proposed structures within a local historic district shall require a certificate of appropriateness from the local historic district commission. Agreed. Got it. Okay. That's why I sit on that commission so I can tell you these things <laughs> 10 years later. 
And just with regard to subsection six, I, I'm not clear why we would take away just the ability to have a discussion with them about whether they might be able to add additional setbacks. I mean, maybe we can't require them, but I don't know why we would take out the language that allows us to at least, you know, go back and forth and say, could you do this? And I mean, we might be able to do that anyways, even without the language, but I don't know. So I, I agree with you. I think that the, my problem was the use of the word requirements and then the whole provision, if they do not alter the allowed use, diminish the permitted intensity of use. I think you could, you could say planning board may request, um, you know, different dimensional and setback dimensions um, in addition to those, other than those required by the ordinance and just, or, or in order to address the intended purposes of site plan review and just end it there. Okay. Rather, rather than having all, because the, the, the rest of it, the use of the word requirements and all of the other stuff makes it sound like it's really a requirement. I was under the impression from what somebody said during that discussion, it may have been Andy, that um, this would be in conjunction with a special permit or some other, or? Yep. or no, I was saying that you could do it, you wouldn't need this if you had a special permit. You can already Right, exactly. So I thought it was being covered anyway, but mm -hmm. maybe that's the wrong assumption. And mm -hmm. uh, with Beth's suggestion and your clarification, we could keep it in here for the random, times that it stand that the site plan review is standing on its own and we don't have any other option right. for discussing setbacks. It just to simplify the language. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good catch. Thanks, uh, Beth. Sorry. Yep. Um, the lighting section I think could be just generally beefed up to be all dark sky friendly. And yes, it's, yes, it's, it's, yes. It's, uh, there's a, <laughs> but, that's just a general, we don't have to look at it here, but it could be much, much more robust, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are principles on websites about dark skies. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, most of our applicants now with the big one, big parking lots are coming in with um, down facing, low um, spill, et cetera. But I think we need a statement in here for that. And mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I think it's a lot to do with landscaping, um, just generally, landscaping and screening. Um, I, had a, I had a general concern about the introductory phrases to number one and two, where it says, except for zoning districts where the setback requirements are less than 20 feet, and except for zoning districts with no size setback requirements. I think in the first case, I think you want to say, to kind of relate it not to the zoning district, but to where the building is and say, except when the principal building is less than 20 feet from the street, a landscape buffer strip should be, you should be provided. And, um, and you know, again, that's, that's just kind of trying to get away from this parking in front of the building, right against the street. And a continuous landscape buffer strip between business and industrial districts and any residential district should be provided in any case. You know, we don't have to talk about the, the, the depth of it can vary, but you so, certainly want to have um, residences buffered from industrial uses. So I think, again, there's, there's kind of a, a beefing up we could have of that section generally. Agreed. I didn't Anybody know, else? yeah, I just had a question in general for everybody. You know, we've talked about these large parking lots and requiring, um, what do you call those, islands, landscaped islands after uh, 20, 20 spaces. Mm -hmm. um, are, we, are we doing okay with that? Does that need to be beefed up at all? Um, should there be trees and not just bushes? I don't know. I just, I feel like these big expanses, I, I, I know we got slammed on the Mersin um, parking lot and they called our bluff, but 
that was more about on the street and this would have helped us if this were cleaned up. So um, I would suggest internal tree landscape, internal trees is, a, is yeah. an important thing uh, because they tend to go around the periphery a lot and leave the inside all, all uh, barren. And um, there is a, there are studies that say that uh, for, that a tree canopy coverage of 40% is uh, an appropriate standard to try to reduce the heat island effect. And so that, that could be a starting point, say that the trees should be designed so that at maturity, they'll cover at least 40% of the area of the parking lot. And you know, that we may find that that's too much, but that's, I think, been scientifically proven to be a good, a good number. I wholeheartedly agree with that relative to the expansive parking lots we've seen or approved over the years, yeah. Yeah, because these little bushes are doing nothing. When I, you know, even uh, Green Street, you know, it's pretty, but it's not really doing anything to reduce reduce the the heat. All right, add that into the uh, list of things you need to look at, Andy. And, I think we're giving, I, we're giving you more work, but at least it's focused. No, thank you. It's uh, this is very helpful. Thanks. <laughs> And I would, I would also suggest that we look at um, encouraging those islands to be designed to capture rainwater, the storm water, rather than to be totally curbed. Because you know the traditional way to do it is to put a, a six inch curb around the, the landscape island. So you have to water the plants and you have to then channel all the storm water into storm drains. But if you made them more into um, rain gardens, like the one at the senior center, there's a, there's a really nice one. Oh, not the senior center, the uh, the Bresnahan School. Uh, there's a really nice rain garden there between two areas of of uh, paving, and uh, that's a way to you know to be sent environmentally sensitive rather than to be you know highly engineered. Uh, so that's uh, thinking about not just this this the the size and contents of the of the landscaped islands, but also how they work for stormwater would be helpful. Yep, I uh, got that agreed. I uh, rain gardens and essentially the low impact development techniques is sort of a preference for stormwater management um, to the maximum extent feasible, really. Yep. More on landscaping, Rick? No. Okay. What comes after that? Environmental performance standards. And that's that might be where we talk about sustainable, sustainability and um, resilience. Is that? Oh, actually, um, stormwater runoff. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, water quality. Before that, water quality. Yeah, um, I wanted to add a number four that would say something to the effect of adherence to industry standard low impact development practices and list a whole bunch of them, some of which we've already talked about, um, but as appropriate. And I'm gonna stick pervious paving in there some year, somebody's gonna agree that these pervious pavers are safe to, um, to snow plow over. But rain gardens, rooftop rainwater, catchment systems, other decentralized, um, micro scale controls that infil exactly what you said, infiltrate, yeah. store, evaporate, and or detain rain off close to the source. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it belongs here rather than where I had it in parking. Yeah, put it in here. And I, I sent that to Andy, so he's got the wording on that. Um, but that highlights all of those new techniques in a separate cat, uh, number four. And actually that kind of merges into number to F because it talks about Maximizing groundwater recharge. Yeah. Um, Andy, you want to scroll to the next section after erosion control? See what else is there. Ah, here we are. The environmental performance standards. Did you have something on this, Rick? 
No, I think I think it actually does belong back up where you were talking about it before under stormwater and water quality. Okay. That's really where, where it fits. Okay. So um, this is the where are we going from here? Anything on these exciting things like utilities? Um, I would offer one uh, point with utilities. I don't know if it's so much a criteria for the planning board review as it is even um, something we're working on uh, with the water department right now for advanced planning, but um, we need to make sure that whatever is allowed under the zoning um, is something that we can provide water for <laughs> and we can treat water for, right, wastewater. So um, we're having some conversations about the um, city's water supply and wastewater treatment and, and making sure that we have an idea of um, what the remaining capacity is, right? So I think to some extent, um, it's a criteria for consideration, but I think it really belongs more to um, what we allow as build out under the ordinance, essentially, uh, even earlier than, than someone getting to this point where they're before the board and saying we have a project for review. But uh, I note that because it has to do with utilities. So um, you're saying it doesn't fit into site plan review or it fits in somewhere else in site plan review? Um, I don't know that it needs to be here. It certainly would not hurt at all to have a criteria that speaks to the, this, the uh, city's ability to provide water and sewer and so forth. But um, frankly, I think that it's, it's better really that these issues be addressed even earlier than this by making sure that the ordinances effectively do not allow um, enough build out in one area of the city or another or collectively um, that might exceed what, what the water department can provide in future decades. Well, it certainly wouldn't be here because this is um, development and performance standards. If, if you wanted a mention of it so that we can ask the question, it could go into section G, site plan review criteria, if you want to put a placeholder in there. Sure. Yeah, I'll make a note of that one. Um... To speak like, to DPS or whomever yeah. um, is managing that 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 capacity issue. Yep. We could even actually, frankly, put it up in F as a uh, submission, or sorry, not F, but um, E. Uh, have them uh, provide confirmation that there's there's no question that capacity is there from from the water and sewer divisions. But and yeah, but I agree. I'll let me uh, take a look at that one and see where where maybe better belongs. Okay. And, and in that regard, this is kind of a related question. Do we require um, that an applicant contact um, the other private utility companies to confirm that the utilities as shown in their plan um, can be served by, by the private utility? And I guess some examples I've had are um, electric transformers on site uh, where a site plan was, this is not here, but other places where a site plan was approved and then the electric company said, we can't service that transformer there. You need to, you need to put it somewhere else. Do we require that to happen before they submit a site plan? Yeah, it's a valid point in question. We have not, I haven't seen an issue that, I, that you know, rings a bell anyway here in the report that's happened like that. Um, although I've certainly seen a few instances like that in my career. Um, but I for the most part, we haven't seen that conflict here, um, but um, we also don't really reach out to the you know, say National, Gar National Grid and, uh, and say, you know, have you looked at this plan, the access point, the bowlers around equipment, you know, is that something that's workable? Um, we obviously hope the applicant has closed the loop on their end on that one, um, but, um, and, and as you know, if, if, if they have a problem, they might need to come back for plan review or modification, but um, we don't typically reach out to them um, other than the city's own utility divisions. I'd like to follow up on that, if I may. And, you know, furthering that, I, I think it would be helpful if there was some verbiage in there that, that the planning board has the right to require uh, relocation, shielding, et cetera. And probably the best example I can think of, folks, is our water pollution control facility. In my opinion, we spent hours and hours and trying to make the brick building nice and grand and all those things. And then you continue to walk down and you see the great big transformer there. You see the great big diesel generator there, et cetera. And I realized they needed to be there, but there was you know zero consideration for any type of fencing, shrubbery, et cetera. And, and so it, to the extent that you all agree with me, we should have some type of teeth in our in this area to require not only the review, but eventually the implementation of some form of shielding of these utilities. I agree. Yeah. 
And it can be under utilities here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, anything specific to um, these two districts that are then talked about under utilities? I think it's just. I think they're under under utilities or. Oh, are they are they separate? Yes, yeah, so they're yeah they're further subsections where the ordinance has additional provisions for our two waterfront uh, districts, right? And I think I think the word marine is excess there. It's just it's, they're both waterfront districts, but they're not marine districts. Yeah. Yeah, I, I honestly didn't look at this very closely. I don't know if anybody else did. You know, quite frankly, I think given that um, this involves some architectural consideration, um, uh, I, you know, we haven't really talked so far in this meeting anyway about how far you want to go with adjusting or having more criteria for architecture. And obviously, I'm I'm thinking of commercial or industrial areas more so rather than say resident, you know, residential. But um, that's another whole LHG type discussion. But um, but even for you know the downtown or Story Avenue area to have even more particular standards for architectural design and compatibility. Um, you may want to um, continue this dialogue on this particular provision or area, um, given that it might involve um, more thought and, uh, and a wider discussion. Well, back to um, the zoning rewrite committee or whatever we called it. Um, we were told then that this was such a specialized area that the city would hire a consultant to work with us on these and I, I go with that. I mean, Leah and I threw around some ideas and on architectural design and getting more detailed and we got stymied right from the beginning. What's the purpose? You know, what are we trying to accomplish? Where do we wanna do it? How do we wanna do it? It is a huge can of worms. And on top of all of that is the political support to get any of it passed, whether it's in the zoning code or a standalone or what have you. Um, and putting into site plan review any more detail than we already have um, is probably not a wise idea. So all that to say, it's a conversation for another day in my, my book. I don't know um, if others have other opinions on that. If you've given it some thought, please put your mm -hmm. ideas out there because um, we need to move on this at some point and it may come sooner rather than later. And, and keep in mind as well, I mean, even if you weren't to touch this portion and we were to bring another package forward for updates, um, you know, we could obviously leave in, intact the provisions that, that uh, we're not touching, right? So um, we wouldn't lose those anyway, that those provisions that might be in there today. So just a question, the, the WMU district, is essentially, isn't that essentially the same as the Waterfront West District? Uh, no, actually, um, you know, I pulled up the zoning map because I knew I figured this type of question. So um, uh, let me just pull up here. So if I zoom in on sort of the downtown area um, right here. So um, the, the hatched area is the downtown overlay district. Uh, um, Waterfront West is this blue with the hatch in it. Yep. Um, then you, then you have the uh, waterfront um, marine dependent. Um, the green is the agricultural conservation zoning district. We happen to have um, designated some park areas like Cashman Park and the central waterfront as AgCon. Um, but, but this is the waterfront marine dependent area in the green. No, I'm talking about the waterfront mixed use, which is the blue area. And I see it's oh. actually the it's actually oh, yeah. it's waterfront west and also to the east of the- and, uh, Into the east, yes, yeah, sorry. Right, for the waterfront uh, mixed use, yes. Yeah, it's those two sides yeah. of the central waterfront. And and obviously, they, because we didn't touch the commercial buildings, you see those uh, bump outs around the former NRA land. Yeah. So I, I guess I just had some questions about the, the building height provisions there, they seem really confusing, but uh, it's probably just a matter of, you know, not making any recommendations at this point, just making a recommendation to look at them and try to clean them up. 
because it's they seem contradictory and they also seem like there are some some issues there that I would disagree with. Um, it sounds like we're recommending that people put skylights in, and I'm not really sure that's what it really what we really meant to say. Yeah, again, if there's any architectural design standards that make sense to change here, and I'm I'm happy to take a look further look at this uh, particular one as well. I I, I would I, I agree completely that we should include to the extent you can you can come to consensus on um, updates to these standards if they're inappropriate for that district. Um, that we include that even even if we're talking about this particular bullet as opposed to the ones above. Um, if you think that something should be adjusted because it's not necessarily something we want to encourage, then I, I would concur we should change the phrasing while we're tinkering with that section. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's too too detailed for tonight, but I think it's something we should look at. Okay, um, does that bring us to the end of site plan review? It seems like there's some more there. There's more. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a long section. Um, so we've got some other things like the building design, um, um, public street, you know, vistas, ground floor uses. Um, yeah, I know this, this, is, this is a little bit like the 40 hour district waiver, but with something like that to waive some standards um, rather than variances. Uh, we did we tweak that language um, and then you have the waterfront overlay district right so that's again another waterfront district which we're um, unless we're getting into another whole waterfront west discussion we might not be taking with that section <laughs> no. right now but um, but uh, but, they, but it's there so it has some it's just like the waterfront marine dependent and uh, or uh, mixed use I should say well that that will get adapted I assume once we if we do look at rewriting the overlay district agreed right Right, we would pull that. Spending any time on that now. Right, and then the rest of this section um, is is more of the administrative parts of it. So um, unless you wanted to weigh in on, you might have some thoughts on. Um, Don might actually have some thoughts on this. I know from prior discussions on projects, but um, performance guarantee provisions. Um, if you wanted to maybe update, you know, anything in the section here, but the rest of it is more. Um, Kind of bullet plate stuff. There's a couple of um, mandatory conditions type stuff that says, you know, prior to the construction inspection fees, you know, um, we're going to tweak some of these to make sure they're up to date. But um, um, I don't know that there's a whole lot to spend on on those. I think the plan board typically addresses the type of um, um, mitigation issues that, that might need to be addressed more than any other board does. Any last thoughts on site plan review from anybody? Okay, good, uh, good, good discussion. And I think we're done on that. Um, I'm gonna make an executive decision not to talk about parking only because um, there was a little confusion in Andy's directions uh, earlier on. And when he gave us direction to look at site plan review, he then sent out a second message that said we wouldn't be looking at parking right now. Um, because it's so linked into so many other pieces and it just expanded the amount of work that the staff would have to do and they're not ready to do that. And then he incorporated it into the staff report for preparation for tonight. So um, I'm gonna stick with his first piece of advice, <laughs> which is not to deal with parking right now. Um, all of that being said, if you have something that you really want to stick into his notes for future consideration on any of the parking um, ordinance, this is your time to speak up. All right, then we will save that for another night or day. <laughs> All right, that is the, um, on our agenda for tonight, that's the end of our public meeting topics. What we're gonna do now is um, take a motion to move into executive session where we will um, review the minutes and approve them from the executive session that um, we held whenever it was back in May. And at the end of that, we will close our meeting for tonight so this is just to formalize our procedure saying that we will be not returning to public meeting after our executive session. So with that, I'll take a motion to, what does it say? 
Um, Bonnie, I'll move to go move uh, to uh, go into executive session. Thank you, Don. And could I have a second on that? I think uh, don't we need. Yeah, I'm sorry. If we could just, yeah, if we could just for the record uh, note, I think that's for the purposes uh, pursuant to Mass Journal Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation in the matter of the institution for savings in Newburyport and its vicinity versus City of Newburyport Planning Board, 93 State Street, as the open meeting may have a detriment to the effect of the litigating position of the public body. And so I may uh, amend my motion to so move, Andy. That thank you. And, and I would I would recommend that we add further add to the motion that just to make it formal that uh, following the executive session we will adjourn without returning to public session. Don, you want to incorporate that into your motion? Sure, I'll I'll do that if that's okay with everyone. And sure. I don't know about the first and second. <laughs> uh, who's going to second it? I'll second, Alden. Okay, I will take roll call to go into executive session. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Don? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. We are now, oh, we now have to log out of here and follow the link in our staff report to go into executive session. We'll see you there. Okay, hey, thank you.